Let's get a boilerplate Chrome extension up and running. Keep in mind that not all of these files are required to get a Chrome extension functional. Just for the sake of this video to create a holistic view on what a Chrome extension is, we're going to create all of these files. So let's start with, of course, the manifest.json. It is a JSON file. We'll create a background script. We'll call it background.js. You can call it whatever you want. We'll create a foreground script. I'll call mine foreground. You can call it whatever you want. I'll then create a pop-up page. I'm going to call it popup.html. It is an HTML file, just like the options page is an HTML file. So these files here, one, two, three, four, five, are like the five basic boilerplate files needed for a, well, quote unquote, needed for a Chrome extension. Let's see if I can reorient the page like this. So let's do the background here. Let's close this and the foreground down here. There we go. So let's start with that manifest.json. We're going to have, it is a JSON, so open and curly, closing curly braces. Everything's in double quotes or no quotes if it's a number. We're going to start with the name. I'm going to say obj extension. We'll say a description. Let's say, I don't know, my extension. And we'll say a version. You do have to manage the versions yourself. So I'll say 0.1.0. And then we'll move on to this manifest version. I've never seen it other than two. It used to be one, obviously, I think. I've never seen it at anything other than two. So at the time of this video, it's always two. So it's a manifest version. Let's move on to the icons. Let's define some icons. So icons is an object. I'm going to define the 16 by 16 icon. We'll say slash, I think it's OBJ or is it my OBJ? It is OBJ. So OBJ dash 16 by 16. Dot PNG. We'll copy this line, one, two, three, and the next one is 32, and then 48, and then 128. And then we'll just change these guys here. So 32, we got 48, 48, and then 128. There we go. So we've defined some icons. Let's move on to the background script. That's defined in something called background. This is an object, and in this object, there's another property called scripts, plural. And it's a list, an array of all the scripts you want to execute when your extension either gets installed or refreshed. Currently, we just have one script, so slash background.js. Let's move on to the options page. Options page is defined in options page. And that's going to be dot slash options.html. And let's move on to the pop-up page. That's defined in something called browser action or page action. Page action is a bit more complicated than browser action. So for the sake of this video, we're just going to use the browser action that has a property called default pop-up. Pop-up like that. And we're going to define that pop-up as popup.html. And then let's define some permissions. Now permissions are everything your Chrome extension needs access to. Things it needs to do, tabs it needs access to in order to run. By default, there are no permissions. You can't do anything with it. So you have to be explicit about what you want in the front end and the back end. So on the back end, we need permission for something called tabs. This is going to let us basically track what the user is doing with their tabs, tab IDs, URLs, things like that. So we're going to need tabs, and then we need to be explicit about which domains we want our Chrome extension to have access to. So for the sake of this video, we're going to be using the Google landing page as a, as a tester. So HTTPS colon slash slash www.google.com slash star. There we go. Permissions. And that is not an object. It is an array. So delete this. There we go. There we go. There's no formatter, of course. Let's do this. All right. So I have a basic boilerplate manifest JSON up and running. Name, description, version, manifest version, icons, background, options, pop-ups, and permissions. So for the background page, this gets executed as soon as the Chrome extension is either installed or refreshed. There's no delay happening. As soon as they install it or if they refresh it manually, this thing, this script gets executed. So console.log, and you'll see why I'm emphasizing that in a second. So console.log, I'm just going to say from background. And for our front end script, I'm just going to say from foreground. So there we go. All right, so let's move ahead to foreground, installing the script. Now, technically, we're not installing the script. In order to install the script, you need to pass some benchmarks, some criteria. 
Then you upload it to your developer console on Google. They approve it. They upload it to their store, and then you can download and install it. So technically, when we're working on it in developer mode, we're not installing the script. We're loading it unpacked. So we click Load Unpacked. We navigate to the folder we're making this extension in. We select this folder, and just like that, this is our, this is our uh, Chrome extension. So now, there are two different consoles when you're working in a Chrome extension. There's your foreground console and your background console. In order to access the foreground, it's the same thing as always, either F12 or Control shift j and we get the console. That's a foreground console. To access the background pages console, or the scripts console, we click this background page here. So we click that, and we have access to the console here. And as you can see, it says from, excuse me, from background. Watch what happens when I control L, so clear that, and I refresh the extension. So let me move here. And again, whenever your extension either gets installed or they refresh it, this script gets automatically right away executed. So let's go back here. Let me refresh. Pay attention to the background console. Let me can I increase the size there. Perfect. So I refresh and we get the from background. Now where's the from foreground? Well, we need to inject that foreground script into the foreground. This doesn't get automatically executed the way a background does. And so we inject it with a function from tabs, which is why we needed it in the permissions here. Chrome.tabs.execute script and three parameters or arguments. The first argument is the tab ID you want to inject the script into. Now, just because I'm on this, this tab right here, doesn't mean I can't inject that script into this tab here. So this would be the active tab. Let's say this is one, tab ID one, two, three, four. Just because I'm on tab one doesn't mean I can't inject the script into tab four. But if you want to inject your script into the default or the active tab, you just pass a null there. So that's the first argument. The second argument is the file you want to inject. So we're just going to say slash, and it was foreground.js. And then the third argument, which is optional, is a callback function. We're just going to say, and let's say I injected. There we go. And we'll save. And we go back and we have to refresh the, the, uh, the Chrome extension. Now pay attention to the background console and pay attention to the, this little area right here. So I refresh and what happened? So it says I injected, but now I have unchecked runtime last error, can't access Chrome, whatever. I go to the errors and I get that exact same error. What's going on? Can't access Chrome colon slash slash. You can't inject your Chrome extension into this URL, quote unquote URL. It's not valid. It's not an HTTP or HTTPS. This is a local URL or URI. Chrome colon slash slash. You can do Chrome URLs, settings, version, extensions. So this is not a valid domain to be injecting your JavaScript into. And so just because we've defined, hey, I want to be able to inject my script into www.google.com. It doesn't mean we can be lazy on the back end and not check which page we're injecting it into. So how do we check which page the user's on so we can actually inject the script into this domain? Well, we have to use another method of tabs. So let's go back here. So what we're going to say is chrome.tabs, and we're going to listen, basically add a listener to what the user's doing. And so it's going to be, what is it, on activated. And we're going to add a listener. And that listener is going to listen for a tab ID, or just let's say tab. And that's going to tell us what the user is doing with their browser. I'm going to just console.log so you guys can see what it is. And this is going to print out in the background. I'm going to uncomment or comment this line out. We'll go back. We'll refresh the extension. So here we go. Refresh. Now pay attention to the background console. So that's my active tab, that's my active tab. So anytime the user clicks a different tab, our background is listening for that and it's telling us what the current tab or the active tabs ID is. So that's how we're going to know which domain they're on. So how do we do that in the backend? So we have the tab ID. We can also use a function called chrome.tabs.get and based on a tab ID, it'll get, a, it'll get us all of the information about that tab. So this is gonna be, let's say current tab info, like that, another callback. And now we have something called the URL. So console.log, and we'll say current tab info.url. We'll save, we'll reload our extension. Let me clear this, let me clear this error. So clear all, go back, 
pay attention to the background console. I refresh the thing. And now I'm moving between pages, Chrome, new tab, Chrome, new tab, Chrome, new tab. I can go to, let's say, Google, www.google.com. I can go back here. I can go back to Google, and we can see the domains right here. So we're going to listen for which tab the user's on, and then we're going to do a get call for that tab ID, and then we're going to see what URL they're on, and if they're on the proper URL, which is this URL here, this HTTP stuff, then we're going to inject the script. So we're going to say, and this is going to be a regular expression. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to explain it. If you want to know, you can just look it up. I'm going to say if it matches HTTPS colon slash slash, we need to escape those slash slash and www escape dot. So if they're on google.com and that test, and we need to do a google.com dot test and we're going to test the current tab info.url. So if they're on the actual URL, then we'll inject the script. All right, let's uncomment that. Perfect. So now we go back. Let's do a clear. Let's go back into the extensions. Let me get rid of these two guys. There we go. Refresh. All right. So now when we go into the Google site, we get I injected. Let's see if the foreground script actually injected. So we're going to do the foregrounds console, and there we go. We have from foreground. So again, just to sum up what we just did, as soon as you either install or refresh your Chrome extension, this background JS script gets executed. It does not wait. And so in order to accurately inject your script into a specific domain, just because you've notified the Chrome extension of the, of the domain, of the permission, doesn't mean you don't have to code it in the back end. So you have to check what your user's doing, and then when they do what you want them to do, then you inject your foreground script. So let's do this before we move on to the pop-up and the options page. In addition to executing or injecting a JavaScript, we can inject a CSS script. So let's do this. Let's create a script. CSS. Where is the thing here? Let's say, I don't know, mystyles.css. And in this styles.css, we're going to create an animation of a class, we're gonna do spin, 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 and we're gonna say animation name, let's just call it spin, and we're gonna say animation duration, and we'll say, I don't know, like, let's say one second, one second, and then we'll do animation iteration count, we'll go infinite, and let's define the animation, so at keyframes, and it's gonna call be called spin, we're gonna start at a 0%, and we're gonna say a transform of a rotate of zero degrees. There we go. And we'll copy this, we'll paste, not there, paste here. At 100%, we'll rotate, what is it, 360, 720, 1440? Is that three spins? We'll see that. So we just defined a CSS file in our backend. We need to inject it when we inject the, uh, the foreground script. And so it's kind of the same. Chrome.tabs, instead of execute script, it's insert CSS, the exact same argument listing. So current active tab, and then the file. So I'm going to say file slash, it was mystyles.css. And I'm going to omit the callback. I don't need the callback for this. So I'm going to save. We're going to go into our foreground, and we're going to capture the... We're going to capture this thing here. Let me close this. Let me maximize this. So as you can see, our little icon also shows up in the top right here. So let's capture this logo. So right-click, inspect, and what's it going to be called? Does it have a, an ID or a class? Unique ID? All right, there's no unique ID for this image, but there is a unique ID for its parent. So we'll go by the parent. So we'll say, let's see if I can capture it this way. So it's going to be document.querySelector. Uh, like that, and the ID of its parent is HP logo, and it's the image. Does that capture it? Perfect, that captures it. So when we refresh our Chrome extension, it's going to execute the background script. The background script is going to inject our foreground script. Our foreground script is going to capture the, the logo, and it's going to add a class. So class list dot add that spin, spin, spin of the CSS, and that spin, spin, spin is going to spin the logo infinitely. So save, let's go back, let's do a refresh, and let's go to the Google front page. And if we see this, we've just injected a foreground script that uses another injected 
style script to spin a logo. So this is basically how a Chrome extension works. The background JS monitors what the user is doing. Based on what the user is doing, you inject scripts into the page, and those scripts act like any other script.js you write. So moving on to the pop-up and the options. These ones are easy peasy. So let me do this. Let me go pop up here and go options here. They're literally HTML pages. You can attach scripts to them if you want. For the sake of this video, we're not going to. This video is getting long. So we'll just close down the background. I'll put the background here. All right. So for our pop-up HTML, we're just going to say, I don't know. Again, it's boilerplate HTML. Let's say an H1 on the pop-up. Like there. We'll save. And we'll do for our options. We'll say H1, I'm the options. Literally that easy. So we go back to our page, we refresh the extension. Now when we click the little icon on the top right, we get I'm the pop-up. That's the page we wrote. In order to get to this options page, we go to our Chrome extension here, we'll click details, and we'll click the options down here, extension options, and we get I'm the options. So literally just HTML pages for your pop-ups. And your options, you can inject, or excuse me, you can attach scripts to it like this. I'm not going to for this video, but again, literally HTML files. That's how these two work. So how do we handle state in a Chrome extension? How do we get the foreground script to communicate with the background script or the front end to communicate with the back end? And so to show you the answer for those two questions, I'm going to, let me stop that spinning first. So save, let's do a refresh. Stop the spinning, stop the spinning. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put two buttons on the Google landing page. When we click that first button, it's gonna set some data in the storage. When we click the second button, the foreground script is gonna tell the background script, hey, there's some data in the storage, take the data out of the storage and just print it to your console. To start off, I need some permissions for my storage, so I'm gonna go into my manifest.json and I'm just gonna say storage just like that. So let's add those two buttons to the front end. Let's do a... Let's say first is equal to document.createElement. We'll create a button. Let's say first.innerText, and we'll say set data. And then we'll do a first.id of first. And I've defined some CSS here just to position the buttons on the page. So let's go copy. Let's do a paste. And this is going to be the second button. And so that needs to be second. This also needs to be second. And this also needs to be second. And the text will be, uh, let's say, shout out to back end. There you go. Let's add these guys to the page. So document dot query selector. We'll get the body and we'll just do an append. And we'll go first, copy paste, and we'll do a second. Let's go to the front end and see if we have the buttons on the page. So refresh. I need to refresh the page. There we go. Oops. There we go. So we got set data and shout out to backend. We click the buttons and nothing happens. Let's wire up the add event listeners. So we'll do first .add event listener. We'll listen for a click and we need to set some data in the storage. Now there are two ways to set data in the storage. We can do chrome.storage.sync and we can also do chrome.storage.local. The difference being if I'm using this Chrome extension on this browser, on this machine, and I use sync, if we set data to the sync. If I go to a different machine, different browser, but I sign in, that data syncs across devices. For the sake of keeping this video simple, we'll just use local. So chrome.storage.local.set, and we're just gonna set a password. So password, and we'll say, I don't know, one, two, three. And let's just do a console log so we know that we hit this button. So console.log, and I set data. There we go. Save, let's go back to the front end, refresh. Refresh the extension and then navigate back. If you're wondering why I'm doing a refresh of the extension and then refresh the page and I go back to extension and I go back to the page, it's because we're listening for on our back end right here, on activated. On activated only triggers when you activate the active tab. So if I refresh this and I go back to here and there's some sort of data left over on our Chrome extension and I don't refresh, it won't refresh the tab. And so Programming a Chrome extension can be a bit hairy in that you have to account for everything your user's doing. Refreshing the page like this is not the same as activating the tab like that. And so you'd have to have code in 
I think it's chrome.tabs.onupdated, a different listener, just to get a, an accurate view or an accurate beat on what the user is doing with the browser. So that's why I'm doing the whole refresh the extension, going here, refreshing this page, going back to extensions, tabbing off of it, and then tabbing back on Google. Anyway, so I set the data, and I get the I set data. Perfect. Let's uh, code the second button. So second dot add event listener. We're also listening for a click, but this time we need to send a message to the back end. So to do that, we need Chrome dot runtime dot send message, and we're going to send a message of it's an object. We'll say I don't know, maybe yo check the storage. There we go. All right. So we've sent the message. Let's do a console.log so we know we're doing it. Uh, let's say I sent the message. There we go. It's back to the front end. Go to extension. Refresh. Go here. Refresh. Back here. Back here. Set the data. I set the data. Shout out to the back end. I sent the message. We need to receive this message on the back end. To do that, let me bring the background script here. We need another listener. And that listener is chrome.runtime.onMessage.addListener. There we go. And it gets three arguments. It gets the message sent or the request sent. So we're going to say request like this. It gets information about the sender, and then it gets uh, an object or a method that we can use to send a message back to the front end. So we're just going to say send response like this. All right. So let's check the message. So we can say if request and we put the request in an object and it was dot message is equal to, and the message was, what was the message? Yo, check the storage. All right. Yo, check the storage. So if that's our message from the front end, then we're going to get the data from the storage. And to do that, we just do chrome.storage.local.get. And we pass a string, or it's an array of strings if you want, a string of the key we want. And the key was password. There we go. So it's the first argument of get. The second argument is the actual answer or the value. So say value like this. And then we're going to print that value to the console. So console.log that value. There we go. Let's go back to the front end. We'll refresh the extension, refresh the page, go back here, activate the tab. We set the data. Perfect. I set the data. And let's go to my background. There we go. Background console. Shout out to the back end. I sent the message. Go to the back end and we get the message printed out. And so it got that message from the front end. It checked the message. The message was, yo, check the check the storage. It checks the storage and it prints out the uh, the value here. Now there's two ways to communicate back and forth. I'm going to show you this way and then I'm going to show you, just like we said, chrome.runtime.send message. That's a, a way of initiating a message string with the front end and back end. When I use send response right now like this, so I'm going to send response. I'm going to send a message. This does not create a new message string. It's on the same message string as this guy right here. So I'm just going to say message is equal to, yo, I got your message. There we go. And to get this message on the front end, or it, it doesn't matter, you can go back and forth. To receive this message from someone who sent a response, you have to code for it in the send message method right here. The second attribute, or excuse me, second argument of this would be any sort of responses. So I'm going to say response, and we're just going to say console.log the response, like this. All right, let's go back to the front end. And again, I'm just showing you the call and response between the front end and the back end. Go here, we refresh the page, we unactivate the tab, activate the tab, hit set data, there's data in the local storage, click shadow to back end, and we get I sent the message, back end gets OK. I got the message. I'm going to print out the value. I'm going to send the response, and that response was, yo, I got your message. Now, how do we initiate a message string from the back end? We did it with the front end with this uh, send message. In order to do that, we'll do message. Not response, send. Let me move up so you guys can see. So send message, and there's, I think, four arguments to this. We're going to use the first two. The first two are the time, tab ID and then the message. The message is going to be the same. It's going to be, yo, I got your message. And so this tab ID can't be null the way this guy was null to indicate the current active tab. Uh, so we need the actual tab ID of the tab that we injected the script into. Luckily, we have it right here, unactivated, this tab ID. So we need to save this outside of the scope of this function here. So let's say let active 
tab ID equals zero for now. And then once we get the, uh, the active tab ID, we'll set it right, and we'll set it right here. So active tab ID is equal to tab dot tab ID. There we go. So we have the active tabs ID. We can use it to send a message right. So we don't need this send response here. We can send a message right here. So that would be the active tab ID. Now we need to, just like we had in our background here, we had the listener for listening for messages. We need that in the front end. So Chrome dot runtime dot on message dot add listener. And it takes three arguments or gets three arguments, the request, the information about the resend, the sender and the ability to send a response, which we're not going to use, but I'll code for anyways. So we're not even going to do an if, we're just going to console.log that, console.log the request.message. So let's go back to the front ends. We're sending a guy message. Let me space this out. It's crude. All right, there we go. Back to the front end. Refresh the extension. Refresh the page. Go back here. All right. Let's click I set data or set data. We set the data. Shout out to back end. We get last. The message port closed before the response was received. All right, so why are we getting this? So we got the message we're sending from the back end. Yo, I got your message. Why are we getting this undefined? That's because we're expecting or we printed out a response from the initial message string right here. So we need to de delete this guy. It's expecting a send response object to this guy right here, but we're not using it to send the message anymore. We're using our standalone or opening a new, uh, new message string with this guy. So we can delete this. We'll save, we'll go back. We will refresh the extension, refresh the page, deactivate the tab, activate the tab, click set data. We set the data, shout it to the back end, and we get, there we go. I set the message. The back end gets the message, prints out the value from the storage, sends a response, a new message string saying, yo, I got your message. And on the front end, it gets that, yo, I got your message. And so this is just how we handle state and messaging between the front end and the back end in a, uh, in a Chrome extension. And so that's going to be it for this video, guys. If it gave you any sort of help, don't forget to give a like, subscribe if you haven't already subscribed, any comments down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.